Johnny Brook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS. Well, thank you for joining us for another edition of Donnie Brook. Great to have you with us. Lots of topics. So let's jump right into it, shall we? Let's first meet the panelists, starting with Wendy Weiss from KTRS. She's 50% of the Jennifer and Wendy show there. From Euclid Media, where she's an editor, the editor, the top uh, poobah. Chief Cook and Bottle Washer, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Fenske sitting in for Bill McClellan, who's taking the week off. <laughs> Ray Hartman from KTRS, RawStory.com, and the Riverfront Times. And from the St. Louis American, Alvin Reed. Wendy, we're going to start with you. Uh, what can we say about Catherine Pinner? She won the primary race on the Republican side for St. Louis County Executive in St. Louis County. And uh, she then dropped out. She got back in, and after last week's program, maybe she heard us or watched us, she dropped out once again. I think at this point she needs a little more compassion than criticism. Maybe the question for us is, who should be on the ballot for the Republicans? Well, a little birdie, who apparently is also a poobah, explained to us earlier <laughs> that Shamed Dogan is now actually available and legal. Um, I've thought he should have, I mean, I thought he should have been the winner all along, frankly. So that, that, would, uh, that, would, that would work for me. But as long as her name has been removed from the ballot, which was the, the word that we received last Friday, that she was in court asking that her name be removed officially from the ballot. And I agree with you. We have to remember that she is a human being and that while this has been a kind, of, kind of a wild ride, we need to be compassionate with this woman who may or may not have a few things to work out. But, <laughs> no, 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 seriously. Well, well, right? well, well don't we all, don't we all. <laughs> that's what I mean, that's what I'm saying. That was kind That was kind of, you made Shabby Dogan sound like marijuana. He's, you know, <laughs> like available. He's and, legal. He's legal and available. <laughs> He's legal. Right, yeah. You can buy him at a dispensary. I mean, it's, it's, it's rare in politics that you kind of get a do-over. Yeah. And I think he should go for it. Because at too. least he could now say, fellow Republicans, you know, you need to get out here and vote for me, just like exactly. you would have if you had known who you were voting for the first time, and just see how many votes he gets. I think I, he'd be a great candidate, and I know a lot of journalists feel this way about this guy, because when you talk to him, he's so smart and he's reasonable. I think the big problem he has going for him is anybody in the party brass who is annoyed about any of the positions he's taken. He's been anti-Trump. He hasn't always been in line with that wing of the party. They now have the excuse to say, hey, he was on the ballot. The voters chose the other guy. That's going to be a tough hill for him to overcome. And we don't know what their process is, to your point. I mean, who's making this call? <laughs> if, if they were making it... You know, Mark Montavani's name has also been surfaced, even though he's a Democrat, and he could easily make the case that he that this should be because I I would make it that this should be nonpartisan. So it really doesn't need to be. And Shamed Dogan, to me, I said all along, I thought he was totally qualified and would be a good county executive, and I I still feel that way. But so either one of them would be good candidates. But, but to Sarah's you're, point, you're, to, wait, you're to right Sarah's about, point, right no, Mark to, to Sarah's point, though, if this if the county Republican Party, which is kind of analogous to the Democrats out state, which means they're not used to winning, uh, if they if they stay within the framework of typical Republican politics and let this be about whether you're for MAGA or not, mm. they're just going to get the I floor. I think you're right on that. But what about Jane Duker? You know, most people <laughs> don't remember this, but yeah. it was just three weeks ago, whenever she, uh, <laughs> she lost. She actually did get more votes than Catherine Pinner or Shama Dogan. Yeah, but uh, why yeah, would but the Republican they, Party, not why would they want to appoint Jane a Democrat? Exactly. They, uh, I Mata, get raised I, points. Mata Vani, they Mata might. Mata I don't think they would with Jane. I, I don't, you never know. Would, would, I think Montevani would actually work for some yeah. Republicans. I think he would, too. And okay. he's going to, by, by word on the street is he's going to get a lot of write-in votes. Oh, he hmm. will, for sure. Sarah, um, as the great poobah that you are. <laughs> <laughs> I really want this title to stick. <laughs> She's Let's my boss's boss, I might. You're executive editor at Euclid Media. Yes. Uh, and uh, you know a lot about journalism. You know where the bones are buried and all that and more. 
Well, let me ask you this, though. As Eric Schmidt, the Attorney General and U.S. Senate candidate, the Republican, running for office, seems to get his name in the newspaper a lot. I think it's all by design. I'm not sure he cares about <laughs> this. But the latest thing he's doing, he's using the Sunshine Law to go after professors at the University of Missouri Columbia who happen to work on the school newspaper. And as state employees, they're subject to the Sunshine Law. And now there's outrage, like the St. Louis Post-Dispatch editorial page and others, outrage that they're going after the professors or the journalists. And it seems to me that journalists like the Sunshine Law unless it's used against them. What's your take here? Well, I mean, we do really like the Sunshine Law because we're into transparency in government. I don't know how going after a journalism professor's emails plays into transparency in government. So I don't know that journalists are being hypocritical on this. I will say, when I was at St. Louis Public Radio, my most recent job, we were employees of the University of Missouri because the station is part of that umbrella. And we were told, yes, people could try to Sunshine Law any of your emails. Be careful what you put into emails. It was always known there was that threat. And the idea was that we would certainly fight it if it happened, but a case could attempt to be made. I think Schmidt is making the case here well, we, because these fact-checking sites, these are very unpopular with Republicans. They feel that it's the imprimatur of trying to claim you're nonpartisan when you're really partisan. That's what he's going after here. To what, it, to what public purpose? He's the attorney general, I know he doesn't believe this, of all of the people, not just the ones who voted for him or not just one party. To what, what purpose is our state's top law enforcement office officer going after a newspaper? What, what, for what purpose? Well, you know, you might ask the same question of the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, which just filed 89 sunshine requests against Senator Josh Hawley. Obviously, the sunshine law is being used as a tool to get information about people. And, Ray, you just can't, say, the, by, if, you can't say, if Tony Messenger uses sunshine law, well, that's noble. But if Eric Schmidt if Eric uses Schmidt, it, it's oh, a, it's malevolent. I, I, with all respect to your whataboutism, this, uh, the, I'll repeat the question. This is the state's official. But you're not state answering, you're, but you're not answering well, no. his question. Well, they're not public officials. No, the DNC so one thing just they, went after Senator Hall. Fine. If they, any citizen can, can, uh, can file a sunshine law, including Eric Schmidt as a citizen. The question is, why is he, as our state attorney general, I, all the lawsuits he does, and by the way, if he's so interested mm. in sunshine law, maybe he'd like to comply to the request that well, Mark Petroli had you know what? and, and he, Eli Gross about... Does he think that there should be a level of fairness at the, at the, at the state level in, in terms of journalism? It is not the role of the attorney general to, to, to fight a political war with a newspaper uh, a state uh, because it's a Columbia, Missouri. The point is, if he's so interested in this, he might want to release his information about how, how involved he was with the Republican Association of governors when he was uh, a Republican Attorney General's Association, excuse me, hmm. that uh, in their involvement of bringing people to Washington with a robocall on January 5th, he doesn't seem to want to answer any of those questions on, on, on that. And my you, point you know is what, this. I think, I think Sarah hit a good point, though. It's just, when she said that PolitiFax is not popular, Neither are journalists. Journalist approval is like but, 8% but, 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 right that now. That's, that's kind of so, where I was well, going. Yeah, right. right. This is completely and totally Can't, about him getting his name in. Right, this right, right. Campaign. Right you are. And, right but you are. there is a certain respect that I think you better have for your flagship state university in anybody's state. And hopefully there are people who are ultra conservative who would get on the phone and tell him, back hey, off. dude, back off. Now, if it's not happening, that's too bad. But like I say, if there's no if there's no sense of this is you're getting a little out of co control, dude. This is one of the ones. But, that but just Elvin, is too you have far. to admit, if journalism professors yeah. teach how to use the Sunshine Law, because taxpayers write the paychecks for the public servants, and so they they should have a right to know what the public servants are doing. The same should be true then of anybody, including the attorney general that. A lot of people don't like, maybe. Well, yeah, he, Charlie, he has a right no. to know well, right. what Charlie. state employees are up to. It's a real First was. Amendment issue. Right. Oh. I mean, that's... You know, Charlie... There's actually, an argument to be made that these are not people who should be... Because I could, I could make Charlie, a sunshine request on every professor at Bob Jones University. No, no, because that's a private school. Well, that's I'm sorry. Wrong. That's right. hey, I meant for just on a public school. Hey, okay. And Charlie. the only reason I'd be doing it is just to be doing it.
Well, right. It is so what you get the name and paper, this. and he played Charlie. me like a Stradivarius. And We're talking about it right now. he's taking on the media. Uh, you're now, now you're right. And, and the thing, They're not here, the media. It's well, a university he, newspaper. He, no, it is a newspaper. That's, that's the media. I, I understand that, but this is this is. What was the what was the professor's name? Melissa? Was it Melissa? Click. 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 Okay. Click. What? She is the face of the media still in the minds well, of many, okay. many people. Well, that's right. the issue. But why is he suing the New York Times? Okay. Because he knows he that they got plenty of money to come at. Well, because that's and a private enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Private Charlie, enterprise. Private. Question, I have one question for you. Give me 10 seconds Do you and we got to move on. Do you think that... The sources of the Columbia, Missourian should be uh, that that it uses as a newspaper. Its confidential sources should be revealed to the public. Is that what you think? So that that, that well, I, I'll a, answer this yes. with a statement, and that Thank is, um, if you don't want to be subject to the Sunshine Law, don't work for the government. So basically, you can't have a yeah, newspaper. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You can't have a newspaper. You, you can't be you protected from it. You can't have a lab it. newspaper. As, as long as the taxpayers are paid, you think, write your paycheck. So you can't have a lab newspaper because otherwise, I don't no know exactly ever, what a lab newspaper well, is. Well, a lab newspaper is the Columbia, Missouri, okay. and is a teaching newspaper. And by your definition, including a student newspaper yeah. that yeah. did that, yeah. you can't it's, have it's any kind of a tough life, Ray, as you know. It's a tough life. Okay, well, okay. Well, now, Alvin. Somebody have Coach Drakewitz email because I want every one of them. Yeah. You're entitled to it. <laughs> no, no you're not. Right. Right. Ray, not let's move on to Jessica fan Clark. Fan. She is a member of the Rockwood School Committee, and she said some things that were, that were disparaging and insulting to kids with LGBT, who are LGBTQ, uh, as well as uh, some disabled kids. And she used a term which I probably don't even want to repeat on PBS to describe some of her detractors. Mm -hmm. So the Rockwood School Committee, in its wisdom, removed her from the Wellness Committee. So? And I thought, look, her speech is disgusting and insulting, and maybe the voters who put her in there can recall her, but I don't think that government should be canceling her in any way. And as a former member of the ACLU, you agree with me, don't you? I do not. And, and there's such a misunderstanding, I guess, of course, after your last run at the First Amendment, I don't know. Um, but the um, a misunderstanding of the First Amendment, the First Amendment does not guarantee us the right not to have consequences to our speech. It guarantees us a right to, make our, to speak. It guarantees us a right not to be locked up for our speech. And it certainly, in her case, I would not be in favor of her getting kicked off the school board for her speech, but but for her to have a consequence, like to be taken off of a committee for her speech, mm -hmm. is perfectly well with it, well within the First Amendment. And and the, by if, if you don't accept that premise, if you say, well, as it, because it's the government, the school board can't can't do anything ever to anyone it, it, regarding their speech. Basically, I guess she could say, well, I want to be on every committee. You know, I want to do every, you know. The bottom line is it, it's a minor thing, and it's, it's absolutely within the First Amendment to, to, to pay a price for your speech. And within the authority of the school board. Absolutely. To pick See, the committees I, I, that they're on? I, I, sure. I, I would say that Why uh, not? They, they can do certain things, but the government should not be punishing people for speech that is legal, however offensive we find it. It's not even punishing. It, it, I, I don't I, think I'm she's on the Bob the Herman, committee. Nadine Strassen right. side. Uh, government should not be in the business of censuring I don't think legal speech. Nadine well, I, I, Strassen I did not, not say that. Yeah, she's got a new book out and then she's... This is an administerial function, right? Somebody has to have the rules that govern this board. That's like the one power they have over these members that are elected by the public. And so they get to say who's on what committee, what time they meet. I don't see that as censuring at all. But well, if they did that in the ordinary course of action, that'd be okay. But this was obviously in reaction to the speech, which they found disfavorable. At the behest of parents who were horrified, whom they represent. Well, all the, of the them, parents correct? can probably recall this woman or they can vote in somebody else oh, next probably time. recall them now it's just she has you can't leave her alone well, well <laughs> apparently I, no, no no apparently because they are not she's... the government that's my whole point i okay. don't like the government whether it's the school committee or the federal government punishing people for legal okay. speech okay let's say i never you know said anything like really out of line before and i got elected to a school board somewhere okay? <laughs> or just right here just, all right and then i just went on some tirade and says like what we ought to do is arm the little black children and tell them to police mess with you take it into your own hands all right so now my school board said like hey you know what alvin was duly elected so you know whatever or uh, some other district well you know i don't what? like some i pop up and say like you know i i think everybody's okay except jewish people 
right? Okay. <laughs> and then like you're saying, like, well, what can you do? Alvin got elected. You know, That's like, hey. no, no, very there, good there actually there, there's a guy yeah. like that. His name was Dapper O'Neill, longtime member of the Boston City Council, <laughs> and people just lived with them. You know, <laughs> well, that's all you could do. I, I that's think we actually could do that in 2022. We can't do well, first that. First of all, but picking not live with that. again, mm -hmm. someone's committee assignment is not anything. It's not it's, even it's not anything that's guaranteed. It job. is not a committee assignment. A is not in the zip code of the First Amendment. Well, Charlie. I think actually a, com a committee assignment for a member of the school board is part it, and parcel of the job description. But it's not. You, so it's, right, a right. well, we it's, a right. it's a right. We may disagree on this one. It's a right. Okay. But let's move on to a story in ProPublica, Alvin Reed, about the private security force that is working in the Central West End and maybe other neighborhoods. I think like many Holly, others. Holly, oh, uh, many other neighborhoods. Oh yes, they are in the Grove. They are in Soulard. Many other neighborhoods. Yeah. So what happens here? And in a lengthy story written by Jeremy Kohler, there are off-duty St. Louis police officers in uniform who are not only making more overtime in their positions on the security force than they would for the SLMPD, but they're also given rewards, Elvin. If they can solve a crime, they get $1,000. And some people are saying, well, you know what? That just means that wealthy neighborhoods have better security and public safety than the poor ones. What do you think? Well, that was true before you came up with these uh, private security uh, firms. You know, um, I cannot, they would say if a police officer, what they do with their time when they're not, you know, being a police officer, uh, I kind of can't argue with them as long as it does not detract from what they're doing. I think off-duty police officers are supposed to carry their guns too. Is that correct? I remember, I. I I think you're supposed to, not just like suggest it. You know, the thousand dollars for solving crime, I, I don't have a problem with that either. I do not think they should be in their police uniform. I honestly don't. I agree. I, that's, that's. Well, and I, they, so they are in their police uniform and they are using the powers of being police. They are not just showing up like dressed like security guards and acting like security guards and having to call in the real police. They are doing pretty much everything they do as officers, except they're paid by private neighborhoods. It's a huge problem that at this point, like for city residents, if you're expecting basic city services, you have to form one of these special taxing districts, hire police officers, pay them on top of what you already pay to have police officers in the city, and then they come in and act exactly like they would do, except they're not under the control of the city police department. It is a strange situation, and there's a reason that the national experts brought in on this ProPublica story said they have never seen anything like this. And if, God forbid, because we know that private security is nothing new in, in wealthier neighborhoods, but if one, of, if one of them were shot or killed, then what? I think the liability would be on the city because they're there in their city uniform, using their city weapon, functioning as a city officer. It's a, it's a really mixed up system. And I think this story did a great job of identifying what's broken about it. This was a great story by Jeremy Kohler. It really was at ProPublica. And, and I, to me, it's real simple. Part of this is real simple. And that is we haven't talked about the poor neighborhoods that have the highest crime rates that are left behind in this scenario. It, to me, what the real simple line is, if you're going to work for the St. Louis Police Department, whether it's on your regular time or overtime, and you're going to wear that badge and you're going to wear that uniform, you report to the St. Louis Police Department full stop. If, if private security wants to exist and hire non-St. Louis police officers, because keep in mind, when they, when they, they, we have a problem in St. Louis, we mean the people of St. Louis, and it's all of our problem, Hire, getting people, police officers, to work overtime in the highest crime, crime neighborhoods. And one of the reasons is these private security companies are outbidding our St. Louis okay. public police departments. That is unacceptable. Do you mind if I jump in here just real quickly? Unacceptable. Yeah. Here, here, here's what I think uh, the story missed, and that is, yeah, it's true that the policing in some of these neighborhoods is not as good as it could be. Well, we got a mayor who, as soon as she got into office, she stopped 98 jobs. She cut 98 jobs that weren't filled, and she cut $4 million from the overtime, Ray. And, that's, and, and she thinks that we have enough police officers, right? So that aspect of the story, I think, should have been addressed because if Walnut Park East or Walnut Park West wants more police officers, better vote for somebody who wants more police officers. If, um, wait, one, didn't. 
that four million get matched by some other money, right. so that right. money got put back into the that was thanks to Lewis okay. Reed. Right. Well, well, like uh, who, well, he he knows a lot yeah. about the police, don't he? <laughs> yeah. right. right. And then also, what if the mayor took some of the. Uh, you know, the Rams, the money, Rams money or some or of the, the, uh, the, the mo COVID, money. COVID money and say, like, all right, I'm going to put a million dollars in a fund. And to get a piece of this money, I'll double what you're paying, getting paid down there. But you got to work Walnut Park and you got to work Baden and you got to work up there. All right. Then we would see. Would you have a problem with that? Well, I think that'd be a great thing. Take some of that Stan Kroenke money or federal money, give it to the police officers. And why not? No, no. I mean, I'm talking about off duty. OK, we're where yeah. I, I ain't giving it to the police. I'm giving it to the security, the security. police. <laughs> right. Well, you but know you what? If it saves lives, I'd be in favor. I would too. But you I can't. Would too. You can't. I think do we're considering this. things we've never considered before right. because people in neighborhoods, whether they're wealthy or not wealthy, are terrified. But, but and, 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 I think it. Wendy's right. And, and Ray, if you didn't have this private security force, you wouldn't have Portland Place. You wouldn't have a wealthy whoa, whoa. section of St. Louis. I would rather have Louis. private security. Whoa! 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 Who
Uh, Panera is going to be the name of a lot of St. Louis bread companies in the St. Louis region. That's and, right. And uh, apparently in the Twitterverse or elsewhere, people are not too happy with that. We almost broke the internet, man. I mean, this was like a huge journalistic story that we broke, and people are very upset about this. A lot of people saying they gave up on St. Louis Bread Co. a long time ago. It's no longer a St. Louis company. The quality is not there. But the big problem is it used to be St. Louis Bread Company throughout the St. Louis metropolitan area. That's no longer going to be the case in St. Charles County, in some of these other like parts of it. They're saying only in St. Louis City and St. Louis County are they going to keep that branding. And even now, a Panera has snuck in to Baldwin. It's a true insult to St. Louis well, yeah, the, and the, the name that we carry. But the gift cards have said Panera since, I think, creation of gift cards. It's true. Right. So It I'm turns just, out this is a cost-saving measure is what our, our little sources tell us, right. and they don't want to have to print two different things. Now, can I correct you? I think that Panera is based in two places, Needham, Mass, and Sunset Hills. Sunset or, Hills, I know it's there. moving out to the. It's moving out to 44 where Merritt's is, right? Oh, what, yeah. flight? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, they're kind of closing their city locations left and right. There's like three or four they've closed in the last half dozen years. So, yeah, they still do okay. have a corporate presence right. here, but it's a well, sad day. Hold, hold all those thoughts because we have to find out what you had to say about last week's program. We heard from Larry Snowpeck of Alton, who wrote, The St. Louis Police Department is understaffed, underpaid, overworked, while Mayor Jones claims the city has plenty of police. Topping our list of priorities has been making funds available to the, run the loop trolley. And free cab rides to Illinois for any St. Louis woman who wants an abortion. You can write us care of 9 PBS 3655 Olive Street, St. Louis, Missouri 63108. Don't forget those emails, Donnybrook at 9pbs.org. And those tweets, hashtag DonnybrookSTL. We like the nine line. Hope you do too at 314 512 9094. And don't forget to listen to us or watch us on your favorite podcast source. Oh. That would be <laughs> Apple, Spotify, Google Play, and TuneIn. One of us on September 6th turned oh, another I birthday. Alvin back. Reed. Alvin Reed. I think is now eligible for Social Security. I'm getting there. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I'm getting yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. 62. Well, 62. Right. Yeah. I, 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 we'd be living off this cake for the next six months. But I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The king of Kirkwood. Did you do anything? Special on your birthday and happy belated well, birthday. Well, I got back. I, I went out to Lawrence for the football game this weekend, and so uh, that's not yeah, special. And we is won. there a school in Lawrence? No. Oh, yes, that a very special one. And and yes. our senators out there aren't like sequestering the journalism department. Good so. point. <laughs> Fair, <laughs> um, Fair well. point. Fair. All right. Well, happy many birthday. happy birthday. returns. Thank to you. you. Yeah. Thank you guys very All much. Right. <laughs> and Good. that's this week's program. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you next week at this time. Have a good one. Donnie Brook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS.